that really made my foot start moving was 50s rock and roll, uh, which I still like today. My dad, he had a lot of cassette tapes and records of uh, uh, Fats Domino, Little Richard, Chuck Berry. And uh, so that stuff was my first big influences. Uh, a little bit later, it turned into uh, Jimi Hendrix, Zeppelin, uh, the original Allman Brothers with Dwayne and Barry. Uh, and then I got into the blues actually after that. And I got it secondhand through people like Johnny Winter. Uh, and Johnny Winter turned me on to Muddy Waters, Lightning Hopkins, people like that. So the blues actually came after the rock. It's kind of backwards, but it's, it's all mixed together, I think. Blues, jazz, rock, country. You know, as long as you have some feeling to it, that's what moves me. In Toto, there's a lot of musicians, there's a lot of things going on at the same time. Uh, my background, actually, I play with a lot of three-piece bands, so it, it was quite an adjustment to come do this. I was used to um, making as much noise as I could with the guitars, you know, a lot of percussiveness with my hands. Uh, to fill up the holes. Well, there are no holes uh, in this band. Everybody's playing, and so uh, you have to choose what you want to do wisely. You have to paint a picture. Whereas in a three-piece band, everybody's just bashing and crashing and trying to fill up. So it was a big transition to learn how to do that and not make grace notes with a guitar and just fill a, a part, play a part. So it was a big challenge and I'm learning how to do it still. Plus uh, learning how to sing. I never was really interested in singing. The only reason that I did sing was because no one else would uh, in my bands, you know. Uh, and in Toto, the first focus was my voice. Um, and I've learned a lot about phrasing. Uh, it's helped my singing drastically because I never was interested in it before Toto. Um, the guitar playing, when I first got with the band, they didn't know I played guitar. So it was very cool that Steve lets me put a guitar on and play along. Because if I just had to stand here and sing, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I don't dance. You wouldn't want to see me dance. Leland Sklar here, out on the, uh, the Toto 2007 tour. I'm. Uh, I'm having the time of my life. I'm coming from this from a very different angle than the other guys because they are a, a set band and Mike Picaro is the bass player of Toto and uh, due to circumstances beyond our control, Mike cannot do this tour. So I've been installed in this seat for, uh, for the, the duration. I can't tell you how grateful I am to be doing this. These, these, these guys are dear, dear old friends of mine and uh, the opportunity to experience them on this level is something that I never anticipated. I've, I've known Steve since he was 19 years old. Um, I still don't understand him. I don't think it'll ever happen. And that's one of the blessings of Steve is he's elusive, evasive, and not pathetic, but there, it leans in that direction at times. To occupy the stage, though, it's really been a fantastic experience. I, I, I kind of find myself standing up here every night, looking around, and, and I'm just uh, relishing in, in the gift that these guys bring to the table. Uh, it's a most unique band, as far as I'm concerned, uh, where we live in a world of, of, of this kind of adulation of classic rock. And I really can't think of many other bands that aren't resting on past laurels but are still growing and developing and that's to me is one of the real special things about uh, Toto is the fact that they're working on new albums, new music, um, when they come out on the road it's a new adventure rather than a classic rock band that's playing songs that are 30 years removed and people long to hear but they're still just living with that. So it's, it's been a, an interesting experience for me to assimilate into this and try to, to do justice. I was um, incredibly flattered by the fact that I was asked to come out with these guys. Uh, I've been involved with their Toto network since the very inception as a correspondent, and the idea that I suddenly have gone full circle and I'm, and I'm occupying the space that I was commenting on uh, is really unique.
Hey, you know, in my career, I've had a million different blessings and countless of uh, fantastic memories. And I've participated in some of the most incredible recorded events uh, in music history. And I equate being in this band right up there with all of those special moments. I never saw this coming. Uh, David Page, who personally called me and asked me to take over for him, was a huge surprise to me and uh, a great honor. Uh, I've known David and Luke and most of the guys in the band uh, for almost as long as they've been a band, almost, uh, almost 30 years, at least 25 years I've known them. And I've had the pleasure of working with them uh, on different projects. David, for instance, uh, we worked on um, uh, the duet song uh, with Michael Jackson and uh, Paul McCartney, The Girl Is Mine. We're also on We Are The World. Uh, I've worked with uh, Luke and Jeff, uh, who I miss dearly, of course. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of was over touring several years ago. I kind of uh, wanted to retire from that. I, I certainly had my fill of it. And uh, <clears throat> after uh, Michael Jackson and Eric Clapton and George Harrison, I thought, well, that's pretty much it. What else is next, you know? And then uh, uh, I get the offer I couldn't refuse. And I have to say that this is uh, really a wonderful experience to actually be in a band where the band is the star. That's the difference, That's the difference uh, in this situation. It's a totally different dynamic because the entire band is the star as opposed to me being in a band behind a star, which has happened a lot. But uh, this is still a whole other league. And uh, I really... Uh, deeply appreciate being embraced by the guys and the fans. Thank you all out there, and this truly is the best band for me. So here's what's happening. As you can see, I have the four keyboard rig that I designed, and uh, in the song there's organ, there's piano, there's horns. And they happen at different times. Sometimes they happen at the same time. So we'll take it from uh, the B section, uh, the not quite a year since she went away part. So that's, I gotta have an organ and a piano. You know, so now I'm in the chorus. And then the last bit of it is I throw the organ back up. With Not to mention the little solo I have. And uh, so by the time we get to the last bit, the vamp, uh, I'm extremely busy. So. In addition to everything else I just did, now I have to go like. Another fun bit of the show for me is uh, Africa. As you know, there's a little solo in that. And uh, I wanted to come up with a slightly different way of doing it because before there were just uh, the two keyboards uh, that David Page was using and that I was using at first. But since getting my own rig, I wanted to kind of pimp it out a little more and see if I can expand on you know, the simple idea of that solo. Uh, as you know, uh, the sounds consist of kind of like a pan-African flute and a kalimba marimba combination. So I wanted to see about uh, individualizing those sounds and really bringing them out so that they would translate really full and well uh, out there. Right, so now that we have the Africa patch going, 
Here's what's happening with that. Here's what's involved. We got the flute bit up here. And I wanted to split the kalimba marimba thing. So I decided to use the two side keyboards. So you get this. So all together it's like. What do I think about during a show? This is a curious question. I love just looking around the stage and just looking at everybody. I'm, I look at Greg a lot. For some reason, drums and keyboards, there's a, there's a, there's a real connection. Um, I used to love staring at Paige when he used to play. And he used to get kind of very insecure because he'd kind of look at me and go, oh, why is he looking at me? And this went on for years. Um, and of course, if anybody does make a um, little mistake, I, I, I'm always on them. Because I, I just, uh, I don't know, it's just a kind of thing. Uh, I'm always looking at Luke, always looking at Bobby, um, Lee or Mike, always, you know, take a little look. But funnily enough, the bass player, the person really rhythmically I'm closest to, I probably look at the least because to me, as long as that's happening, I don't really need to think about it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm always looking over. Sometimes I try to take in as much of the show as possible. I look up at the screens and seeing what's, what's going on there. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, our LD makes a change and I see myself, but of course then we have a, a time thing and I have to look away, is it just, ah, it's so weird. Um, I look at the lights and then I look around at the audience. And sometimes it's amazing how many people you recognize. Fans that come night after night. They're just in a different place. Uh, but it's, it's really cool, just kind of, uh, I'm one of those players that doesn't, I don't put my head down and play like I see a lot of musicians, a lot of drummers actually. I like to kind of look around and see what's happening. I just don't want to miss anything that might be something remarkable that would happen on stage or out front or there's a lot of little things that maybe the audience don't ever get to see uh, and Luke turns around to me and is just cracking up because something went down, you know. Um, but it, it, sometimes I find it just stuns me where my, where my thought process goes, where the brain goes. And I have to pull myself back occasionally because we're halfway through a song and I'm thinking, hang on, have we done the second chorus yet? <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, so I kind of have to just rein my brain back and concentrate. And, uh, and that's even worse, because then I know I'm, I'll never concentrate then. Over the years, uh, as the band has played Africa, we've, we've kind of approached it from a different perspective. Um, and now what we do, we actually use a loop, so it's in a way more like the original, like the record, because it's the original record loop. But what I play is something a little bit different. Um, so, and you'll see from that angle exactly what's going on. The secret with playing this groove is you have to play it quietly. You don't want to play it too loud because um, the drums have to sit with the loop. The loop actually occupies almost the front end of the drum kit. I'm almost playing a supportive role to this. So um, you have to be very sensitive with this groove and that way it just feels better and it kind of locks in with the loop and makes it more fun for everybody. Another thing I want to actually demonstrate is bottom of your soul. Uh, and what's kind of cute about it is it's, uh, 
It's quite polyrhythmic and it incorporates the octavans, the little snare, and the hi hat. And one of my favorite grooves is anything that's in six or three or nine, uh, but six especially, or 12, because it's all the same, really. Um, it's just a lovely groove to play. Um, I'm going to demonstrate it for you. Most of the times I don't even think about it. I just kind of get to that spot where Greg's horn part finishes and I think, well, I guess it's time to play a solo now, you know? Um, other times I, I kind of have a plan. I think, okay, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start on, on the toms. I'm gonna play kind of quite slowly, um, triplet form maybe. And it's funny, I don't know what happens, but I start and it comes out totally different. Not what I planned at all. Uh, and I just feel, uh, you know what, with me, some people, some players play, they kind of have it planned out. I just never have it planned out. So I just kind of go where, where the drums take me. Um, it's a musical thing. Welcome to my world, man. All I can tell you is that I'm very honored here to uh, be able to do this for a living in the first place, which is a pretty cool job even after all these years. I'd like to show you some of my, my instruments that I'm very, very proud of. Some new ones and some old favorites that you may have seen before uh, in various tours and whatnot, but I got a lot of new stuff this time. The Music Man uh, Dargy Delight, which is a, a rare guitar. You can see it here. And it was made, especially for me, in this uh, I would say olive green, very interesting here, but you must really notice what's on the headstock here. Little martini glasses. All those inlays, all the martini. Love this guitar. And uh, thank you to uh, Scotty Ball for making this happen. And of course I have my new flash, Ernie Ball straps, you know. Thank you, Brian Ball. Uh, what we got here, here's, here's a Here's a beautiful quilt top right here. It's uh, the Ball Family Reserve, which is uh, only going to be for this particular year, I believe. They only make a certain amount of colors, a certain number of them, so people get into this stuff, and like anything else that people like to collect, they want to get the whole lot, you know, if you're crazy enough to do that sort of thing. I would say, oh, this, is, this one is really cool. There was only, I don't even know how many of these were made. Not only is it the beautiful, like, uh, flame, flame top you see right here, but it's also, it's got this uh, maple block in here, which gives a little bit more of a crunchy Les Paul sort of a sound as opposed to, you know, my, my normal EMG stuff, but uh, still retaining the, the classic Music Man vibe and sound and feel. Um, what do you see here? Here's the Bahama Blue, a lot, getting a lot of action on this one. This is another of the Ball Family Reserve, which you can see right here. And they're all so beautiful, and I wish I could play them all at the same time, but, you know, as one does uh, <coughs> go through different things, I have some different tunings here, really nothing too much deeper than a drop D on, a, on the first couple of tracks, just to give it that, you know, <coughs> that crunchier sound. This has to be my old fave right here. <coughs> this, old, this old boy and I have gone through a few nicks and dents along the way. Mine are covered up, but these are still here. Uh, this has a little sustainer unit on it, which I rarely use, but occasionally it's a little bit of fun. Uh, this one has, you can see that it's had a lot of sweat on it. This, you know, they're all great guitars, but some of them are really just, you just fall in love with just one, one or two that you just go, oh, well, I got to go back to this one if I'm going to 
for the full shred or whatever, you know what I mean? And this little red candy apple red guy, this is sort of like the spare to that, which is also one of my favorites. Uh, I know I know Biff will be pissed off, but sometimes I put a smoke up here and it's got a little burn mark on it, so it has a little personality. Uh, this is basically the same sort of setup. I love the tremolos that they have, the non-lock tremolo, uh, you know, to do all this other stuff. I used to have the Floyd Rose stuff on the first model, but you know, as Bison, come over here and say hello. This is my guitar tech, Bison. Guitar tech to the stars. And you. Uh, and me, right? <laughs> yeah, which is not really in the same breath. And this man's a legend. Worked work with Angus Young. Oh my God, the Genesis boys. I mean, you know, go on and on. You can get yeah, a little, Steve Lukather. Oh, oh, yeah. Him. Well, that, that guy sucks. That man. guy. Uh, I can kind of run you through this here. You can, if, you, if you come in, you can see some of the... What's some of the stuff? Uh, like, that's just, this is like a regular sound, right? The pipe that has a little delay on it on these PCMs 70. That's the little Octavia unit. There. Now this is now this one just winds it all up here a little bit. Very subtle in the way it just spreads it a little bit. It's almost like doubling your instrument like you would in the recording studio. Uh, right here is that custom-made boss uh, unit that Bob Bradshaw made for me, which uh, you can kind of hear. It's beautiful for, beautiful for like, you know, chord changes. I wouldn't necessarily use it with a crunch sound, but I'd use it for the cleaner. And here's like the fa fast Leslie version of the same sort of thing. Use, using this stuff sparingly is really the key, you know, you can overdo anything. I like chocolate cake, but not at every meal, you know what I mean? Uh, this is a, a customized Univibe, which gives you that uh, Hendrixy sort of a sound, or Robin Trower made famous as well which I use on only a couple tunes. But yeah. So you can kind of dig where that's at. And this is the full shred. Uh, this is here in, used in conjunction with this uh, really cool pedal uh, the, that the radial people made for me. Radial tone bone. You didn't see the back of the rack, but it's in there. It's very apparent. It really gives you the sustain from hell, you know. That full, like, solo burn sound, you know. That's, uh, this is a volume pedal, and I have this wah wah pedal thing. That was rather big Jim Sullivan like what I just did there. Uh, obscure reference, but you old hipsters don't know who that is. Anyway, uh, and a chromatic tuner. Bang Zoom, that's pretty much it. This has been a really fascinating journey, actually. Um, we, we started so long ago, and, and uh, it, it just seems like it's gone by in the blink of an eye. Steve Lukather talks about being the only member of the band that, um, that's been here from day one, and uh, he's made every concert, which is really a, it's a, that's a pretty, pretty cool thing. However, I'm the only one that's been fired from the band and come back. <laughs> I've actually been asked to come back to this fascinating group. And uh, I was out of the band for a good 16 years. Seems like 16 if my math is correct. Felt like about 50. <laughs> so I, was always, I was always in search of that, uh, that thing that is Toto. You know, you, you could put so many great musicians together, but they really just don't have that flash and pizzazz and the, the musicality Toto has. Uh, 
Yeah, if, if you're in this situation and all of a sudden removed from it, you will always be in search of something that's almost impossible to find. And uh, I was really, really happy when they asked me to come back. And, and uh, it's been absolutely nothing but fun. Uh, there's, there's been some member changes and so forth for, for different reasons. And uh, God bless Jeff Picaro's soul, but um, they, they couldn't have found a better drummer than Simon Phillips who I had been talking with about getting a solo band together right before that happened. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think the day before Jeff passed away. But um, uh, it, it's such a pleasure to be involved in the band again. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's come and gone so far. And hopefully, hopefully we'll be together for many more years. And uh, no matter what, uh, what configuration it goes to, I know it's gonna be at least as good as it is right now because we have a watermark for quality and, and uh, we need to maintain that watermark at all times and I know we will. I was playing with the band in, in Nashville, Tennessee and uh, the stage was slightly smaller in Nashville and, and uh, they propped up the monitors so that they would be at the correct angle. And we were playing Tale of a Man, which was our last encore song. And uh, what I would do every night is I would run out from behind stage and jump, I'd spring off the monitor speaker and do the scream in, in Tale of a Man. And it just so happens that at that particular moment, I didn't realize that the speakers were propped up and the speaker rolled under my feet and I came down on the stage and I made a 90 degree angle with my left leg. However, wrong direction. <laughs> you know how your knee does that? Mine did this. We were nominated as a group for, seven, for nine Grammys altogether. And we ended up taking six of those. Steve Lukather took one, and as a band, that meant seven Grammys for us. Uh, I was thinking, wow, I won't even have to get up. You know, we got nine nominations, and uh, I think the point spread is too, is too vast, so we probably won't win any of them. You know, we won't get any votes uh, because we got so many nominations. That's like winning itself. But uh, ended up having to get up and go up on stage six times on very, very wobbly left leg. But uh, it, it, was, it was like being in heaven. Thank God I had that whole glass of vodka before we got there.